Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the big room. I'm, uh, I'm confident that we will um, warm this room up in just a few minutes with all of the uh, intense um, intellectual engagement and discussions that we'll be having. Um, my name is Ines Corner. I'm from uh, OHSU in, in Portland, Oregon. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all this morning to the AOA Symposium in, on uh, Anesthesia and Consciousness. Um, we have uh, what I think is an outstanding panel of experts this morning who will review for you how the uh, investigations of the uh, anesthetized states really have uh, informed our understanding of what consciousness is, is all about. Um, they will, um, they will um, discuss for you a, a variety of topics um, looking at the, uh, the nature and correlates of uh, consciousness and, uh, and sens sensory um, awareness and um, looking into um, arousal um, from anesthesia and then finally um, actually uh, looking into how some of the, uh, some of the uh, learnings that we've had and some of the network's motives can possibly be used um, to investigate awareness in uh, disorders of um, consciousness. I have uh, asked each of, each of the speakers to uh, um, speak to you for about 20 minutes, and then we will have time at the end for question and, uh, and answers. And I feel like we'll probably have a very uh, engaged um, discussion uh, with all of the panelists um, in the front then. Um, so um, to take us off, I would like to uh, invite Dr. George Mashur um, up to the stage. Um, Dr. Mashur is a uh, professor at uh, the University of Michigan, a professor of anesthesiology, neurosurgery, and uh, uh, psychology. Um, he's, an, he's an active member in their neuroscience graduate program. He's the uh, founding director of uh, the Institute, uh, or the center, sorry, it's uh, the Center of Consciousness um, Research. He is um, funded by uh, NIH, has been funded for a long, long time for his translational research um, on consciousness. He is also a uh, member of the National Academy of Medicine and probably well known to all of you. Please welcome Dr. Mashur. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, Ines. Thank you for the kind invitation to speak and the kind introduction as well. So in the mid-1990s, the search for the neural correlates of consciousness really started to take shape. Francis Crick and Christoph Koch thought an important first step in understanding the ultimate causes of consciousness would be to first explore the neural correlates of consciousness. Now, one would think after several decades of intense research and with the uh, experimental and technical prowess of 21st century neuroscience, that we as a field would be homing in on the specific neural circuits, neural processes, neural subpopulations responsible for consciousness. But in fact, there's still active debate in the field as to whether or not the neural correlates of consciousness are, in what might be considered coarse terms, in the front of the brain or in the back of the brain. And I'm actually taking terms directly from the title of uh, Journal of Neuroscience articles on this very subject. There's some individuals who believe that conscious experience arises uh, in what they refer to as the posterior cortical hot zone, investigators such as Giulio Tononi uh, and Christoph Koch. Uh, and they believe that experience arises in this area of convergence of sensory and association cortex. There are others who believe that the prefrontal cortex encodes content of consciousness. And I'm going to uh, talk very briefly about another perspective, the global neuronal workspace uh, that is proposed by Stan DeHaan and Jean-Pierre Changeau. And they believe that it's really the interaction or, or the, verber the reverberation of these networks uh, that is critically important for consciousness as we're experiencing it right now. Some of the evidence for this was derived from human experiments and the visual modality. And what uh, Dehan and Shen Zhu and others suggested is that uh, conscious experience is not correlated with activity in uh, the primary visual cortex or even in higher order uh, visual areas, but rather uh, requires uh, a, a larger network to be engaged and to be activated. And this prominently involves the prefrontal cortex and is associated with longer latency evoked potentials. 
Now, this article came out when I was a first year as a faculty member in 2007. Unless you think that I'm stuck in the literature from over a decade ago, uh, there is more recent work also from the same group, and this article was published in Science in 2018. And again, this is the non-human primate. Uh, this was a visual task. They were recording from the visual areas V1 and V4 and also the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what, again, they concluded is that uh, a more extended network is required, but importantly, there needs to be a kind of ignition uh, for this network to get activated. And that ignition requires the prefrontal cortex. And once ignited, this uh, reverberant activity leads to a conscious brain. So why might that be the case? These investigators believe that having this kind of uh, reciprocal activity across the anterior and posterior parts of the cortex helps to sustain conscious representation over time and helps make it accessible to other cognitive systems uh, that are important for normal conscious experience. So it's been that focus on this frontal parietal communication that led us to investigate it, us and, and many others. Uh, and as we showed in 2013, uh, there is some evidence uh, of a functional disconnection between anterior and posterior parts of the cortex, and this had been shown in the past, but notably, uh, in this study, it was also applicable to ketamine, which has a number of distinct properties compared to the more canonical GABAergic anesthetics. So ketamine, in terms of reducing this directed functional connectivity, looked very similar to propofol. Uh, and sevoflurane. And this has been replicated. Uh, it's been corroborated by fMRI studies. And in fact, there are several investigators in the audience. Uh, Vincent Bonhomme uh, demonstrated in 2016 uh, that ketamine uh, functionally disconnects anterior and posterior cortex. Uh, ben Planck and Michael Abaddon did work on sevoflurane, and there's abundant evidence with propofol. Now, more recently, uh, this French group uh, confirmed this and specifically uh, investigated nodes in the global neuronal workspace and found, again, that ketamine, propofol, and sevoflurane functionally disconnected these areas. So I've told you about the evidence that supports it. There's also a lot of evidence uh, that brings it into question and suggests that there's a more nuanced uh, view. Uh, Drew Hudson has published work on this recently. And in fact, in the current issue of anesthesiology, uh, Phil Blistes, who's in the audience, and some of the other people in my group have back-to-back -back articles suggesting that although frontal parietal connectivity might drop after the induction of anesthesia, if you wait long enough, it comes back, and the brain appears to be toggling uh, between these different connectivity states. So there's some evidence for this. Some of our own evidence suggests it is much more complicated and more work needs to be done. Now, what I've been talking about uh, for the past few minutes relates to the content of consciousness. So we're conscious right now. Why might we see a blue circle versus a red triangle? But as anesthesiologists, we're probably more interested in the level of consciousness. Is somebody awake or are they anesthetized? And we know that there can be some content of consciousness even during general anesthesia in the form of dreams, for example. Now, when it comes to the level of consciousness, if we're thinking about prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal cortex, we can probably make a stronger argument for a critical role of the prefrontal cortex, and that is because of its extensive reciprocal connectivity with a lot of key arousal nodes uh, in the subcortical region. So, for example, the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus have a tight relationship. Emery Brown, Patrick Purden, and others have worked in the experimental and also in the computational space to suggest that this interaction is critically important in regulating uh, arousal. The prefrontal cortex also has reciprocal connections with the pontine reticular formation. And some of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, such as Giancarlo Vanini, have demonstrated that the levels of GABA in the pontine reticular formation 
uh, appear to be critical for anesthetic state transitions as well as the normal sleep-wake cycle. And additionally, the prefrontal cortex has reciprocal connectivity with the serotonergic dorsal raphe, uh, the noradrenergic locus ceruleus, uh, the cholinergic system of the basal forebrain, and the dopaminergic ventral tegmental area, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about uh, from Dr. Solt later. And this is uh, true for the prefrontal cortex, but I think there is a weaker argument that more posterior areas of the cortex have this same kind of reciprocal connectivity. So based on this neuroanatomy, uh, we wanted to test the hypothesis that the prefrontal cortex could be critical in regulating arousal states, even though we normally think of it as something important for more executive, uh, executive function or attention. So to test that hypothesis, we looked at cholinergic manipulation of the cortex on the reversal of sevoflurane anesthesia. We also looked at noradrenergic modulation, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So we studied 30 rats. They were anesthetized with up to one mac of sevoflurane. The target was about 2.4%, which is the mac for sevoflurane in the rodent. Um, there were microdialysis catheters that were in the prefrontal cortex or multiple areas of the posterior parietal cortex, sensory, and association cortex. So there were three groups here. And after anesthesia with sevoflurane, carbacol was reverse dialyzed into these areas of the cortex. Carbacol is a mixed cholinergic agonist, so it agonizes both nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. And we also had intracranial EEG. So this is the experimental design. Uh, the animals were freely moving and awake. We kept them awake by gently uh, tapping on the chamber. They were then anesthetized with sevoflurane. After 75 minutes, uh, carbacol was reverse dialyzed into either the prefrontal cortex or the sites in the posterior parietal cortex. We then made observations. The anesthetic was discontinued. This is the experimental setup. You can see that the, the rat is in an airtight chamber where we can put sevoflurane in, allow it to come out, measure it, and the rat is able to freely move with both the microdialysis catheters as well as uh, the cables uh, to record uh, the neurophysiology. So I'm going to show you a video that really captures the, the main finding here. So you're looking at the rodents in the chamber, they've been anesthetized with sevoflurane. This animal has the microdialysis catheter in the prefrontal cortex. This animal has the microdialysis catheter in the posterior parietal cortex. And the carbacol is gently moving through uh, this microdialysis catheter. You can see frontal EEG up here in blue and parietal in green. And pretty soon you're, got, you're gonna start to see that the EEG becomes activated. The frequency increases, the amplitude's reduced, and you can note that in, in both of these leads. You can appreciate some epileptiform activity in this uh, parietal lead after parietal stimulation. The next thing that you'll notice is an increase in the respiratory rate, and this happens in both animals. So clearly there's some top-down communication going on. The cortex seems to be activated. You see an increase in the respiratory rate. Again, you can appreciate some of this epileptiform activity which soon dissipates. Now, if we advance a little bit, you can see that the animal that had the prefrontal cortex stimulation is starting to turn over. And when we're studying anesthesia in rodents, we're often looking at the loss of writing reflex, that is the uh, inability of the animal to write itself and get on all fours as a surrogate for unconsciousness and the return of the writing reflex as a surrogate for the recovery of consciousness. So you can see now that the animal that had the prefrontal cortex stimulation is trying to turn over, its, its eyes are open, uh, but with the posterior parietal cortex, you don't see the animal really moving. There are a few muscle twitches. So let's jump ahead a little bit see that this animal that had the prefrontal cortical stimulation has now uh, turned over, it's moving around. And if you advance a little bit more, this animal is looking fairly normal, despite the fact that it's still breathing in approximately one mac of sevoflurane anesthesia. So why might this be happening and why could there be a differential effect 
from the prefrontal cortical stimulation versus the more posterior cortical stimulation. Again, we were collecting samples for microdialysis, and then we looked at the levels of acetylcholine in these different regions uh, during uh, the experiment. So here's the waking state. Now, you can't appreciate the drop in sebofluorine because of the scale of this, and I'll, I'll show it to you later, but suffice it to say that we and others have shown that when you administer propofol or sebofluorine to an animal, you get a reduction in cortical acetylcholine. This is after carbacol uh, is reverse dialyzed. Now, keep in mind, carbacol is working at the level of the receptor. It's not a cholinesterase inhibitor, so it's not directly increasing acetylcholine levels, but you can see about a 600% increase in acetylcholine, and that persists after the anesthetic is discontinued and the animal recovers. If you look at the stimulation in the parietal association cortex, now you can see that drop in SIBO, but after carbacol, you really don't get an increase in corticocholinergic tone. It only starts to come up again after the anesthetic is discontinued. So I've shown you the behavior, I've shown the acetylcholine levels, but why might this be happening? Well, that's when we have to return to the neuroanatomy and think about the tripartite circuitry between the prefrontal cortex, the posterior parietal cortex, and the cholinergic system of the basal forebrain. The frontal cortex projects to the basal forebrain directly. So if you're stimulating in this area, you activate the basal forebrain, it's releasing acetylcholine in the prefrontal cortex, carbacol is on board, so it's potentiating the effects, and you likely get this reverberant circuit that's going on where you're enhancing the cortical cholinergic tone. Now note that the basal forebrain also projects to the parietal cortex, but the reverse is not true. And that's probably why the prefrontal cortex is in a privileged position with respect to controlling cholinergic tone. If you increase acetylcholine in the prefrontal cortex, it will also increase in the posterior parietal cortex. This was shown uh, by my colleagues at the University of Michigan and Martin Sarter's lab. However, the reverse is not true. If you increase acetylcholine in the parietal cortex, acetylcholine does not increase in the prefrontal cortex. And this uh, figure comes from uh, an editorial uh, that was published in Current, Biolo Current Biology along with our paper. Now, how might we control acetylcholine levels in the cortex in the perioperative period? Physostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, and that has actually been studied right here in Montreal, in fact, uh, in terms of its ability to uh, reverse sevoflurane and propofol anesthesia in healthy volunteers, and there was some accompanying neuroimaging. I see at least Gilles Plaud. There might be others uh, in the audience who did that work, but there are also um, some known side effects of a, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. But one of our anesthetic drugs, in contrast to the canonical GABAergic drugs, which depress acetylcholine, ketamine increases acetylcholine in the prefrontal cortex. And this uh, was a paper by Dinesh Pal and my group, uh, published in 2015, showing that during ketamine anesthesia in the rodent, and that's titrated to loss of writing reflex, you get about a twofold increase in cortical cholinergic tone. And as the animal is heading toward the recovery of the writing reflex, there's a fourfold increase. And this is actually important to note because if an animal is moving around, acetylcholine goes up in the brain. So that's one possible explanation for why we saw the differences before. But what you can see here is even before the animal writes itself and moves around, there's a fourfold increase in acetylcholine. So we wanted to explore whether or not ketamine, given during uh, a GABAergic anesthetic, in this case isofluorine, could actually enhance cholinergic tone and accelerate recovery. So we studied 20 rats uh, who were receiving one MAC of isofluorine, 1.4% uh, in the rodent, and they were randomized to ketamine or saline. Now, the dose of ketamine might surprise you. It's 25 milligrams per kilogram, but that's delivered intraperitoneally. In order to get an animal to lose writing reflex, uh, with ketamine, you have to give upwards of 150 mg per kg IP. We also had the prefrontal cortex microdialysis to measure acetylcholine levels, and we had intracranial EEG. 
Now, I was thinking that the animal might show some higher frequency activity in the EEG, but in fact, what happened is the animals that got ketamine went into birth suppression. So the suppression ratio significantly increased uh, in the ketamine group compared to saline. And in retrospect, that's not so surprising. We're giving one MAC of isoflurane, we're giving some more of another anesthetic, they should get into a deeper state. And in fact, past studies have demonstrated that if you anesthetize rabbits with isoflurane and you give them MK801, which is an NMDA antagonist, the rabbits also go into birth suppression. So we thought, ah, it makes sense. Hypothesis is disproven because surely if they're in birth suppression, it means they're gonna take longer to wake up. But then the surprise came and we found that despite the fact that the animals went into birth suppression, the animals that got ketamine had a 45% uh, reduction in the emergence time as measured by the return of the writing reflex. And the reason why that might have happened is because once the isoflurane was discontinued right about here, we started to see a significant increase in acetylcholine in the prefrontal cortex, possibly uh, mediating that effect. <coughs> Excuse me. So to conclude, activation of the prefrontal cortex appears to be important for the content of consciousness. I've shown you that cholinergic activation of the prefrontal cortex, but not posterior areas, can reverse anesthesia, and thus might be important in regulating the level of consciousness. And potentially, subanesthetic could play a role in enhancing cortical cholinergic tone. This has to be tested. We've only uh, looked at this in animals. Uh, it's got to be tested in humans and also humans in the complex perioperative environment with pain and with polypharmacy. So with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our funding sources, and uh, this grant was recently renewed and is go going to allow Dinesh Pal and myself to further probe uh, the, the circuit of the prefrontal cortex uh, and the basal forebrain and the regulation of arousal. I want to thank my many wonderful colleagues uh, who did the work that was reported today, and just a, a general thank you uh, to the great team at the Center for Consciousness Science. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention, and I'll look forward to addressing any questions you might have in the discussion session. Thank you.